got a good one today guys uh thanks and welcome back um just tuned in for the first time i'm steve knight this is uh, the night show and today's guest we've got coming all the way from pennsylvania and i just want to let you guys oh, do your yep. uh do your intro brother awesome man so we are actually one of our uh one of our spots is pennsylvania where we're actually we're pennsylvania we're florida and we're maine so oh, we've got yeah. three different uh yeah three different outlets uh which is pretty cool but uh for us we just explore the whiskey industry it's what we do from reviews to you know from reviews to breaking news to travel to uh history and culture it's just exploring the whiskey culture and history and industry and uh bringing it to our followers so that they have uh you know behind the scenes look into some of their favorite brands and uh, hopefully they can learn more about this amazing spirit that's just played such a prominent role around the entire globe throughout, you know, history for thousands of years. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I like what y'all are doing that whiskey culture, man. It's, it, it seems very, um, it's obviously a passion, you know, you've been telling me just, just, just recently before we started recording, just about just how many bottles you guys have just on site, just where you are right now. And just how you've been able to travel around the country. And there's so many small batch, um, whiskey spots that are, that are just kind of popping up and, and they're making like really, really good, um, uh, products. What can you tell us about the industry right now? Um, what's it looking like for, especially for like small companies? Yeah. So we're, you know, we're seeing a bit of, of a, a crazy moment. So, uh, whiskey throughout history up until, you know, the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, whiskey played a pivotal role in a lot of stuff. It was not just a drink that people consumed to, to have fun and enjoy. And uh, whiskey was not at all what we experience today. As a matter of fact, up until the, the late 1800s, whiskey was just moonshine straight off of still unaged, harsh. You know, it's got a, a <laughs> lot of that, uh, Jet fuel. none of that barrel character, none of the vanilla and caramel that we associate with it today. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's crazy because the industry right now, whiskey played such a prominent role um, historically as you know, in, in religion, in wartime, in medical field. And now it doesn't do any of that. We have all kinds of uh, medical advancements, chemicals that do the job a hell of a lot better than pouring, you know, whiskey on a, on a wound. And <laughs> so right now it's just, it, it's purely commoditized. It's, there's no longer that reliance on whiskey as something other than something that you enjoy drinking. And so um, it, we're, we're experiencing a huge surge kind of over the last five years, uh, towards the seventies, eighties, nineties, people were drinking a, a lot of stuff that they saw drank across seas and, and in foreign locales. Um, you know, here in the U S a lot of people, there weren't really cocktails They were brought back over from Europe, you know, the gimlets and things like that were brought back over and, and that appreciation for spirits as an art form rather than something that was necessary for survival. Um, and so we're, we're seeing the whiskey industry right now just uh, explode again. But instead of exploding from necessity, it's exploding from uh, a commoditized standpoint. And so we've got people uh, now over the last five years, whiskeys that you could find sitting on the shelves daily, they're now impossible to find. Some people are, you know, you can find them on a shelf, but now it's five, six, seven times the retail cost. It's it's crazy. There's like underground markets for whiskey and it's, you know, people are trying to crack down on it. And it's just, it's a crazy, crazy commodity right now. And there's a reason for that. And that reason is that people don't realize as this demand surges and it's kind of become this cultural phenomenon, it's become associated with that, that frontiersman spirit that people are trying to reattach themselves to that ruggedness. Um, But the problem is, is a lot of this stuff is aged like 10, 12, 14, you know, years, even stuff that's, that's considered a younger, you know, whiskey uh, on the bourbon side, you know, a young whiskey, a young bourbon is still four five, six years. And so the whiskey market just exploded really in the last four to five. So you've got still a gap. And even if companies were to produce five times what they're producing today, we're not going to see any of that on a shelf for another five, six to 12, 15, sometimes 20 something years. So it's created this huge supply and demand issue where 
uh, people just want it and they just can't get it. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, man, no, one hundred percent. Especially since we're in Alaska right now. Um, yeah, the whiskey market is a little, uh, a little dried up right now <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. One of my favorite drinks I have is uh, I'm always I always say this wrong, uh, say this wrong, but Willet out of Kentucky. Like that's one of my favorite bourbons. Oh yeah. I've got some, some Willet right back here. <laughs> yeah, I got that genie bottle sitting right up in my fridge right now. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah, Willet, Willet's great, man. It's it's a super historic distillery. It's really, really known for rise, and their bourbons are just phenomenal, man. I, I've seen some of their stuff. Like, I, I was at a, 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 a bottle release in Nashville, and they had uh, some of their 18-year bourbon available, and it's $1,000 a bottle, and that's at – that's at retail. Yeah, <laughs> It's like, that's not even inflated, <laughs> which is crazy, but a great distillery, man. We've been a few times. It's awesome. Heck yeah, man. Um, when we talk about, you know, the history behind uh, whiskey in general, I mean, a lot of it came over during a lot of uh, influxes, a lot of immigration um, times where folks were coming to the U.S. for the first time. Um, tell, tell me about that, man. Like, I, it's su such an interesting history when you're breaking it down, just how cultures kind of clash, however it happens, if it be by force or be by choice, like it's just, it's cool to see what we bring over and what we share with one another. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Um, so whiskey was originally really popularized in Ireland and Scotland by traveling monks. Uh, they didn't have access to, to the grapes to make wine and the wine wouldn't stay good nearly as long as stuff distilled from, you know, barley and all that. So they were basically making early whiskey um, and using it as religious sacrament. And then they were selling a lot of that excess whiskey, you know, as they, as they went for traveling expenses, you know, cause uh, you didn't have monasteries paying you, you tried to get, they'd give you whatever little they could, but often it wasn't long, uh, long or far enough for you to go on that pilgrimage to wherever your next destination was. So you had a lot of traveling monks just selling whiskey, which is crazy. Um, you know, and then it just became popularized there, you know, you started having all these Scotch distilleries, this, these Irish distilleries pop up. Um, but over here in the U S it was almost whiskey was almost, uh, an accident. Um, it was, it was a means of survival. And so it was brought over with a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the pilgrims. And so what they would do is they'd plant corn. It was, it was easy. It had already been cultivated, you know, by the indigenous population here right. in the United States. Right. And it was easy to grow, but the problem was, was winter would come and stuff just doesn't keep well in winter, nothing grows. And so anything that started to go bad corn wise, it was really easy to distill into a whiskey, you know, to, to hold for a long time. They were brewing corn beer, they were making corn whiskey, and then they realized, hey, this corn whiskey is like an antiseptic. If I get a cut, I can pour it on my wound and I'm not going to die from an infection. So, right. <laughs> you know, it, it, it kind of started to play a pretty pivotal role, even down to trade where, you know, a lot of these, these early pilgrims started to trade whiskey as, as a commodity uh, to the indigenous population. And it kind of became like a little bit of survival uh, calories, you know, warm you up in the winter, keeps morale up. It was medical, it was barter. So it, it was all of these things to the, to the early population. Um, and then, you know, as it got cemented and as we established and started bringing in textiles, we actually kind of let the whiskey fall by the wayside. And we, we picked up rum from the islands mm -hmm. and rum was coming back and forth and back and forth. And we couldn't get enough rum. It was much sweeter than corn whiskey. Yep. It, you know, <laughs> it's made from sugarcane molasses. Um, so just, I mean, it's just inherently sweeter because of what it's made of. Right. Uh, but what happened was, was during the Revolutionary uh, War, the Navy for England had a way better, you know, they had a way better naval presence than we did. We were great on, you know, on land. They were far superior by sea because oh, they yeah. just had flotillas that they've been putting together forever. They came around and cut off our rum supply to deal a blow to morale and to our medical supplies and to, we were using it to produce gunpowder. So it was a huge blow, but what they didn't account for was that, you know, years ago, Virginia had Kentucky County, which was a territory at that point. It was not a, uh, it wasn't oh, a yep. state. It wasn't, it was part of Virginia's expanded land. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, to get it populated, they sent people west and they said, hey, if you can't afford land over here, you know, towards the coast where all these big cities are, if you go into the frontier and take the chance and you set down a shack and plant a, you know, a patch of corn, we'll give you the land. And so a lot of people who couldn't afford homes sold everything they had, packed up, you know, took a wagon out there, threw down some lumber and were growing corn. And so... Uh, you know, Gen uh, General Washington at the time, he turned around and he said, hey, we've got like all of these people growing tons of corn. Let's just throw them a bunch of stills and they can make a bunch of whiskey for us. And then we don't have to be reliant on the rum or the rum trade. We could be self-sufficient. It's far enough inland so that the British can't get to it. So then it kind of helped fuel our war effort for independence. So it, it's played all of this stuff and it was you know, it was brought over a lot of uh, a lot of Irish and Scottish immigrants brought over with them their distillation knowledge and their knowledge of whiskey and and uh, a lot of people from England, their knowledge of brewing. Um, and they just, you know, it just kind of became a collaborative effort from there. So it, it came over, you know, over there from from religious and commoditized standards to survival here and then kind of back to a commodity once everything, you know, settled down. And the first time that the federal army was ever called against the people of the United States was right after the revolutionary war over whiskey. So it's pretty crazy. Man, that's so crazy to have such a, like you said, such a commodity that was so necessary for the war effort, so necessary for, for commerce. And then, you know, you zoom forward just a couple of decades and then, you know, you have all the laws that came out in the early 20th century where, you know, alcohol is getting outlawed. You know, you have you know, criminal industries just come popping up overnight and yeah. just filling in that gap. And I remember I was reading um, some history about uh, what was happening in that time period and how some of the uh, chemical and industrial companies were starting to, to like sell off some of their their materials and like people were just getting all types of messed up because of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so prohibition was, it, it was just a, an awful time, man. You had an entire industry built on whiskey and uh, the government just decided. So there, there was this revival movement of just, just this, this big religious movement of, of just what they consider to be foundational Christian values, mm -hmm. you know? And so drinking was, was just off the table. They were right, like, if right. you drink, it's ungodly. It's terrible. It's a bad thing. You're immoral. It's a sin. And so they actually got a lot of these people that followed this religious revival into office and they started talking into people's ear. And all of a sudden it was, it was hugely politicized. There were, you know, there were petitions all over in all the major cities, you know, get alcohol out of the streets. It just makes people drunk and violent and it, you know, it causes marital issues and all of this stuff. And it, it destroys the foundation of, you know, the Christian environment here in the, in the United States. And it was just this crazy, you know, fundamentalist movement. Yeah. And so it, it worked, which is the crazy part. I mean, they just got all of these people into office and helped support them. And it freaking worked, you know, which is nuts. And so you had the government shut down an industry that was one of just a massive industry, people laid off, people going destitute, companies having to shut down that were that had spent decades and decades to generations being built. And all of a sudden, the government just walks up and says, shut down operations or we're throwing you in jail. You're not allowed to have anybody come in. We're putting fences around this place and you got to sell everything you got in here. And just companies that were Titans just folded and only the biggest distilleries were allowed to still produce whiskey for medicinal purposes. And so everybody got a cough. Everybody got, you know, they were Walgreens. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Walgreens. Yeah. Walgreens was one of those companies. They were one of the few uh, pharmacies that were actually able to prescribe whiskey. And they went from like a couple dozen locations to like hundreds of locations just over the short time of prohibition because everybody wanted the whiskey and it surged so much money into Walgreens, they were able to spread. Right. And uh, I mean, it's crazy, but what you had is, is people didn't stop drinking. They just started drinking 
underground and different things and worse stuff. Um, And so you had people, so the term bathtub gin, you know, everyone's heard the term bathtub gin. They would take this disgusting rot gut, you know, pure, you know, pure grain liquor, that's super high proof, just terrible, terrible stuff. They put it in the bathtub and just like throw coffee filters wrapped with stuff or netting wrapped with herbs and berries and stuff. And they'd throw it into the bathtub and, and let it sit so that it just was able to be drank. And that's where the term bathtub gin came for or came from, uh, which is crazy. But you had all these organized crime rings that had a ton of financial resources. They already had smuggling operations. They already had avenues which they could move illicit goods. And they kind of switched from like, you know, drugs and weapons and other stuff. And they just hard pivoted into liquor. And a lot of these places started these big underground scenes, underground clubs, they were paying off officers. And it's crazy because, you know, if, if prohibition did anything, it didn't stop the people who didn't want to drink from drinking. They already didn't want to drink. What it did was it created a, a, you know, criminals out of, the working class who just wanted a beer at the end of the day, you know, they, they just right. wanted to, to sit down and have a drink or have a cocktail or have something. But you know, what it did was it, it ignited this, this rebellious spirit, you know, and, and it's really kind of one of the first times that, that the people themselves rose up, you know, the, the, um, the civil war, it was two governments going at each other and kind of the people were caught in the crossfire. Um, but this is the first time that people were just like, we're not going to have it from the government. We're just as a collective population, we don't care if we're committing a crime. We're just, we're going to do what we want to do because we want to do it, you know? And so, you know, that's what the term speakeasy comes from is all of these clubs that were underground and, uh, you'd have to speak low so that the police that were patrolling the streets didn't hear you. So speak easy. And, uh, You know, it's crazy. Right after Prohibition folded, you had this huge surge in demand for spirits. And of course, whiskey is one of them um, because it takes a while for production to flow and stuff to import. We weren't really making vodka here. So whiskey was the first thing on the menu, whiskey and rum, once Prohibition opened back up. And that's what you were talking about was, you know, you had all these companies and these chemical companies that were like, you know, we could put tobacco juice, iodine, and pure grade ethanol into a glass. Right. <laughs> that sounds like a tasty treat. <laughs> yeah. And so you had these com- these fake companies popping up by night, dropping a couple, you know, dropping a couple containers of whiskey and bottles of whiskey over over at somebody's uh, establishment. And then w- when it started hurting customers, the, you know, none of the information on their bottles was accurate or it was forged. So, you know, other companies had to prove their innocence that they weren't out selling bad whiskey. And I mean, it became a crazy thing. The bottled and bond act was, was the government's reply. E.H. Taylor went, you know, he and a bunch of other distillers went and said, put more regulations in, you know, have the government regulate the whiskey trade and what we're producing so that we can have a label that people know and can trust and it was like crisis mode for them to try to rebuild consumer faith because people didn't know if their favorite bottle of whiskey was a forgery and was going to kill them right. or if it was the, the stuff that they like, you know? Yeah. You know, I mean, what a, what a terrible position for a consumer to be in. <laughs> and yeah, like you said, yeah. like just trying to, you know, build back that faith. Um, that's, ah, man. Yeah. Yeah. The, the whole prohibition thing, I think that's something that everybody, especially now, can look back and be like, that was a terrible idea. Why did you think that you were going to be able to control people's want to like alter their consciousness just a little bit? Like, this is not, a, this is not going to work, which is, that's why it didn't last for, for very long. Yeah. And the crazy thing is, man, is like history is just riddled with times that the government tried to leverage whiskey and spirits and wine and beer for their own political means. You know, when you had Ireland and Scotland, you know, at at each other's throats, when you had England at each other's throats, you know, one of the first things that they would do is they'd crack down on distilleries and it's crazy. They would basically say like, Hey, you're going to be, you know, distilleries, if you want to drink booze, you're going to have to, you know, the distillers are going to have to pay all these extra taxes and all this. And that's, you know, that's where the term moonshine comes from is the fact that, 
you know, these the tax people were hated so much that they would not want to ride out into the woods in the middle of the night. And you had these people who were distilling only by the light of the moon so as not to give away their position. And so you have moonshine, you know, liquor made under the full moon, whiskey made under the full moon. And, but, you know, all over the world, you have governments trying to crack down on producers of spirits, drinkers of spirits, and never once has it ever led to anything good. And they still try. There's tons of history that shows it's right. a terrible idea. What, is, uh, what does that look know? like now? Do you have any um, examples of, of, of some legislation either in the U.S. or you know, elsewhere where, where you see that uh, occurring? Well, you'd be surprised, man. There's still a lot of dry counties out there in the South, like places that just it's still illegal to produce liquor, sell liquor. Um, there's still places that have like federally man or not federally mandated, but like state mandated or county mandated, like like a liquor store is not allowed to open on a Sunday. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. I grew so up like, in one of those counties. Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we we just got back from Texas and there's like counties in Texas where distilleries they, they can't sell a bottle on Sunday. So they're closed on Sundays for, for tours, which should be a huge sales day. And it's like, I'm in Florida, dude. It, it's like the average age in Florida is like 57. And like everyone wants their booze and to listen to Jimmy Buffett. So like <laughs> nothing is closed on Sunday, but you go out into other places and it, it's not like that, man. It, you know, until we started traveling a couple of years ago, we didn't realize not everywhere is like, is like where we are. And, uh, there's just still a lot of antiquated ideas out there, you know, still, still some like echoes from those religious revival doctrines that just yeah. never got changed. Um, but then there's also all these mandates for like different types of systems, like to keep these systems in place. So the big one right now is the three tier system. And, and so the three tier system is like a distillery has to sell it to a distributor who then has to sell it to the account. So a distillery can't go to the bar down the street and be like, Hey, if you guys want, you can come pick up a case of this stuff every, you know, Thursday and you can do 10 cases for the next week of production. They can't do deals like that. They can go send reps to talk to them. But if, uh, you know, if a, a company wants the liquor, they have to go through a distributor and order it through the distributor who has to take a cut from the distillery. So the distillery loses profit by selling it to a distributor. And then the distributor makes profit by selling it to that. And the law keeps that three tier system in place so that the distributors don't go out of business because now it's easy to ship anything. It's like back in the day that was necessary, but like today you could have a local bar and they could just take a day and send somebody around and pick up stuff from their local people, you know, but it, there's just little stuff like that, that they're keeping people in business. They're keeping people doing that with kind of an antiquated system yeah, and they're doing it to like preserve an antiquated system. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know it's kind of a little rough, but uh, you know, I'll say it. I, like if you're having to put in laws to keep a middleman there, like maybe the middleman doesn't need to be there. No, anymore. 100%. Or man. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have still, like, like, there's still reasons for them. They're, they won't like fold, but let some of these craft distilleries have some damn profit back, man. They're, they're losing money having to do a, a, a distillery when there's typically someone at those little craft distilleries that'd be more than happy to load a truck full of cases of their stuff to go sell directly to, for much needed profit so that they can grow. Cause they're, they're small, they, you know, margins are tight. Yeah. No, I feel you, man. Like Alaska is kind of weird like that too. Um, I think for some of their licensing, it's like $250,000 a year. So when you go to like, um, like devil's club brewing, uh, bow good gin distillery, if you go there, you can only have two or three drinks. It's like a, a tasting house. And then you can't play music as well. And you're not allowed to play games. So there's... Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a perfect example. It's like, like what okay, in the world? like what century are we yeah, in? Like, what and, decade and why? is this? <laughs> why? God right? forbid we start playing heads up at a table and we get kicked out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> playing some game of Scrabble. Four. All right. Everyone in the back of the car, you're all going to jail. But... You know, you've got like just, and it's crazy because you think you could go to a distillery and, and buy a couple drinks there to support them. In Florida, just last year, in summer, it became legal for distilleries to sell 
pours of their own spirit at their distillery and sell more than a couple bottles to one person in a year. So they were limited on how many bottles a visitor could, could buy. So if somebody wanted to, to come to a distillery and be like, man, I really like this. I'm driving back up north and you guys don't sell the stuff up here. Can I buy it from you to, to support you all? They, they'd have to look at you and say like, yeah, you can, you can take six cases and your spouse here or significant other can take six cases. So you can take 12 bottles, but if you want anything else, you have to go drive around and find a store that sells our stuff, which can be hard for a craft distillery to get yeah. into stores. Yeah. So like they have to be like, here's a list of stores that you can go buy stock out of. Hopefully they have it. And so it's, it's just like, it's kind of stacked against the small guys and the big guys. They don't have to worry about it. They're, they're national accounts. They're selling, you know, cases and they're selling hundreds of cases a day out of their stuff, you know, but the small guys, like if you buy a case of whiskey from them, every single person in the distillery comes and shakes your hand and thanks you, you know, and it's just how much more impact could we make if we didn't have antiquated ideologies weighing them down and how much more could they grow? And, you know, we don't know because it's not there yet. It's just starting to to get over that hill. Yeah. I can imagine. I mean, there's a lot of industries where it's like that, where, it, even if you are a local distiller, like you might go to a shop and be like, "Hey, man, you like our stuff? Like, maybe we could bring this." Oh, sorry, we have like pretty much like a non-compete clause, and we are only allowed to sell these types of whiskeys or these types of tequilas, and we're not allowed to sell anything else. So that could be yeah. putting a chokehold in their their cash as well. Dang man, I didn't realize that was that was that was actually going on. That's crazy. Um, yeah, yeah, so what, it's crazy, man. So it's what funny. do you got in front of you, man? I've been staring at this this whole time. Like, what are you what are you uh, partaking in? Oh, <laughs> so actually right now I'm, I'm drinking, uh, there's this Laws whiskey rye, but it's the bonded. So it's a hundred proof. It's okay. been hanging out for six years in a federally bonded warehouse. That is a, it's a phenomenal pour. I love their stuff. They're up in Colorado. We actually did an episode with them, um, back in September of last year. And that was really fun. Um, really good Colorado distillery. We actually just got named the official blog of the Colorado spirits trail and the Colorado distillers guild. So we're up there pretty frequently now making, you know, making videos and shaking hands with people. We're headed up in May. We're going to be there once a quarter. So that'll be fun. Uh, These are the three of our most recent, uh, well, the three barrel picks that we have. This was our private barrel. It sold out like that, which was crazy. I I was worried about selling it because I had to put the money up for it because we actually bought the barrel and through one of our partners uh sold it so like we profited off the barrel um and i was so worried my wife and i sat down with the with the owners and we were like okay realistically if we put in you know if we if we put in the fifty five hundred dollars to buy the barrel and get it you know get it bottled what what return can we expect what's the you know what time frame can we expect that return in and it just went like that. And so like, that was super nice. Um, this is Nashville Barrel Company, a really good one of our friends. Um, I hang out with, with Mike and James, the owners up there. It's, they're doing stuff a lot different. So typically, you know, you'll, there's two things that distilleries will do. They make their own whiskey or they source their whiskey. Okay. So they'll buy a, a recipe or a particular set of barrels aged in a certain area or something like that. And they'll just buy them for years to come while they're distilling their own juice or they just keep buying it from those people so that they can put whiskey out. Because like we said, if if they're going to age their stuff for five years and I want to start a distillery today, I can't just magically make my my distillate, my brand new, you know, moonshine, a five-year-old moonshine by tomorrow, you know, five-year-old whiskey. So they'll source um, or they'll sell like vodka and gin and stuff that they can make like you know, in a snap, Oh yeah, yeah. but these guys actually kind of spun it on their head and all they're doing is sourcing really, really delicious barrels. And that's their whole company model. They're, they're not planning on distilling. They're just going out and finding amazing whiskey, bringing it back and, and offering it to their, you know, their people, which is great. We did a pick for them. It's, you know, I, I love their stuff. Their five-year bourbon is, is out outstanding. This one is black button. It's a little, uh, it's actually uh, available for pre-order right now, but it's a little distillery craft place out of New York. Um, 
it's it's a very unique whiskey if you haven't had like a, a northern style whiskey it's very different mm -hmm. up in the north it takes a lot longer to age because of the cold you know that heat is what really has those barrels contract and like soak up yeah. the whiskey yeah. and then at night when it cools down it pushes the whiskey back into the barrel and it's that whiskey passing in and out of the barrel that creates that that brown color it gives it that caramel from the metabolizing of the wood sugars the vanillin gives it that vanilla note the spice you know so it's it's really good a lot of that char flavor that people like but northern ones you know they sit and they they eat that char but they don't work in and out of the barrel as much and it's a very different profile um and then we've got a couple other single barrels that are coming out this way we've got one that's benefiting a, a charity called uh wild things wild places out of texas it's actually so tall, so it's like not whiskey at all. What, uh, what is so tall? And then we've got what's the what's the so it's it, yeah, it's like a um, it's related to agave. Oh, okay, um, but it's a lot earthier. It's like not as sweet as a tequila. It's a lot more mild, a lot earthier. It's really easy to drink. Um, but it, I mean, it's just like you kind of have to try it. It's one of those weird things. Like if you imagine. Have you ever had a mezcal? Like yeah, that yeah, smoky, love them. smoky tequila. Yeah, yeah. yeah mezcal is awesome. But if you take the mezcal and it's almost like you take that mezcal, how it's got that earthy note to it, that like earthy flat note. Yeah. And then you strip out like 90% of the smoke. You're left with like that very mild, earthy, slightly sweet type of, of drink. It's pretty good. I like it a lot. Sounds um, dangerous. But we got one that's barrel aged. Huh? Sounds a little dangerous. I'm about to check it out. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really is. But uh, you know, we we ended up um doing a barrel age so tall, and that's gonna be a charity pick. And then we we're doing another charity pick um with King's Family Distillery in Tennessee. They're some of my favorite, favorite people ever. Um, they're just amazing individuals. We went up there, we did a Christmas special with them. Um, just so much passion for what they do. And it's just like a little family owned husband and wife team. And they're, they're just wonderful, wonderful people. Every time we go up, we have to see them. Um, but we're doing a charity pick of a, a 15 year light whiskey with them. And those are going to go towards the relief efforts for rebuilding from all that tornado damage that hit that oh, yeah. Tennessee area, yeah, I remember. you know, uh, yeah. like six months back. So they're still trying to rebuild that area. So we're, we're doing this pick to help benefit that. So we do a lot of charity stuff. Like most of these bottles that we do do charity stuff. So this one is like charity for canines for warriors. Mm. Um, you know, then the tornado relief efforts and then the wild things, wild places. We, we really like to give back in any way that we can. And we're, we're actually doing a big charity festival coming up April 23rd. And it's uh our goal is to raise $30,000 for canines for warriors at the festival, which will save the lives of two veterans and two dogs. So we're pretty excited for that. Um, but we just try to give back as much as we can. And the whiskey community in general does that, you know, you'll see people in the whiskey community need help. We just did a, a podcast the other day with, with one of my friends, Phil, and uh, he ended up having to have brain tumor surgery and he missed the entire allocated whiskey season where everyone's out hunting. Yeah. And uh, a bunch of these liquor stores and bars and, you know, individuals like found some of the stuff that he had been looking for, but wasn't able to go get because he was in yeah. recovery. Dude, and I was just listening to that him. show, man. Yeah, that was that was yeah. some powerful stuff, man. That's a, that's a really good community. Yeah. And, that, and that's the thing is like, you'll find stories like that all over the place. Like people are leveraging whiskey to benefit the community. And there's some like pros and some cons with whiskey. The, the exorbitant price increases because of the demand. Everybody's getting into whiskey now. So like, you'll see some of this stuff, like I've got some stuff over there. It, you know, it should be $40 to buy on a shelf. On the, on the underground whiskey markets, it's like $250. Like it just, it's, it's crazy, you know? And, and there's stuff that's even more, you know, multiplied than that in terms of like the, the value that people will buy it for versus what it should be. Yeah. But you know, that that's a tough conversation. That's something that's rough that's going on. But then you also have all these people, like some of those people are taking some of those same bottles and donating it to a raffle or a silent auction or something. And so, you know, it, it's crazy because you'll, you'll have these people that are hoarding these 
these really expensive bottles and they've spent a ton of money on it, but then they'll turn around and they'll give a bottle worth $1,500 without even thinking about it to help somebody raise money, you know, to go through chemotherapy. And like, so they, they can pay their bills. It's just, it's a, it's a crazy chaotic world right now for the, for whiskey, but there's so much history, so much community, so many friendships built over a poor memories made and so much good that the whiskey communities are doing for people and, and lives that are being changed. I mean, you know, just in Tampa, you know, our local society raises tens of thousands of dollars, you know, I, I mean, just crazy amounts of money, you know, almost, almost every, every couple of months to benefit somebody in the community or benefit some charity. And it's, there's so much good that's going on in the whiskey community that people don't talk about because the thing is, is people that do it don't want to talk about it. Like people in the whiskey community, there's showboats that are like, look at what bottle I got. Look, I just found this bottle or, you know, but then you've got people that they just don't care about that. And that's the majority of people. They will, they will donate $2,500 worth of whiskey to a charitable event and say like, I don't even want my name on it. I just want to help. And it's, it's a really cool community for stuff like that. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back on the East coast. Uh, we got a couple of like three months left and I'll be back in Maryland and I'm ready to hit the road and, and do some touring, man. I just want to check it out. Heck yeah, man. Heck yeah. Um, I do want to ask you some questions. If this, I did one before we, before we wrap it up, um, like, uh, with the whole Jack Daniels, like uncle Nearest story. I know that kind of popped up like in the last couple of years. Do you, can you speak on that? Any, like, do you know any, any, uh, any of that history? So it, it's funny. I actually have a, an article coming out here next week that I've already written. Oh, and shoot. it's, a, it's called America's first black master distiller. Okay. And it's, it's about uncle nearest and his legacy and how, you know, it, it was kind of stripped away. So there's, there's a thing in the United States and I'm, I'm probably going to get blasted for this, but whatever. <laughs> um, just, yeah. I mean, there, there is a, there's a propensity to sweep uncomfortable history under the rug. And this is why we have and shows like this, where like we can just kind of talk about it in a very healthy and awesome way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but people just don't like to talk about it. And for whatever reason, it's uncomfortable. They don't, you know, it, they don't, it, it's easy to have a, a cognitive disassociation from something that you've never seen. Yeah. You know, like we're right now, you know, not to date the podcast, but, you know, right now we have the invasion Russia, uh, you know, the invasion of Russia into Ukraine. And like you have everybody and their mother who's just become geopolitical experts. <laughs> you know, that's all they're doing. It's like people should do this. People should do that. The government should go in and kick Russia's teeth in. You know, no, we shouldn't do that because then China and then nukes and like you've got all this stuff going on. And it's like nobody... <laughs> None of these people actually have any idea the intricacies of working, but for some reason, everyone wants to be vocal. The less they know about something, the more vocal people like to be about it. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's crazy because you'll see these videos of the people, you know, the families in Ukraine, and you'll see these like civilian death counts go up, you know? Yeah, we've had like, you know, 3,800 civilians die since the invasion of Ukraine. And people are just like, wow. That seems like not a small amount of people, but I don't really have a grasp of, of that because that doesn't happen here really, right. you yeah. know, within our time frame. And it, it's easy to disassociate yourself because you're like, wow, that sounds like a terrible story, but I really don't want to think about it because it's going to ruin my day. And it's like, if we took the time to really put ourselves in those shoes, like I hear so many people that are like, you know, they'll give you every reason why nobody should get involved in that conflict. And it's like, dude, if you were, if you were a Ukrainian right now, having like shells go around you. I, so I, we have somebody that we know mm. who they were trapped in Ukraine. They were just able to escape like in the dead of night during a ceasefire. And she said it was rough because they were, they, it, they either had to make a dash towards a shelter or stay home. And, and they made it to the shelter. And then they said, okay, we have to make a dash out of the city. But right now there's so much shelling going on. We don't know if we're going to make it. And, and, you know, her son looks at her and says, well, if, if we're, if there's, 
if it's likely that you know and, and the, the son's close to my daughter's age which really hit yeah. me but they're like if you know if if there's a, a high likelihood that we're going to die either way can we go home can, I, i'd like to die at home in my room and it's like how, how do you how do you like as a parent you know yeah it just it kind of hits you and it's yeah. there's a disassociation factor that makes hearing tough news easier and i think it's just built into us you know yeah. how can we distance ourselves from from uncomfortable things how can we distance ourselves from difficult things and looping this whole thing all the way back around to uncle nearest that that's kind of what happened so a lot of old whiskey recipes early whiskey recipes do you think that it was the you know do you think that it, it was mostly you know white individuals who were working the kitchens and the stills and brewing you know beer and cooking and making the mash and no it, it wasn't it was slaves and so you have a lot of these you know these slaves who were just brought over here and they started working the stills they started brewing beer they started doing that and you know once you know once the the civil war ended and and the you know there was freedom to be had for everybody which that's a whole nother conversation because right. there was a hell of a lot of institutions. <laughs> we'll do that on another, we'll do that on another podcast. Really <laughs> this is another podcast. But you know, but you had a lot of those recipes just be reabsorbed by the companies that had the slaves or employ, you know, they it reabsorbed them and they they took ownership for those recipes. And the actual inventor of those are just like lost to the ages. They're, they're wiped out of history. They're brushed aside. They're swept under the rug because it's uncomfortable to talk about, you know, right. you think Jack Daniels, this like huge empire. Yep. Like, do you think this like huge empire would love to be like, yeah, so it was, it was kind of like built on the back of a slave, <laughs> like literally and figuratively. <laughs> And, yeah, and so, yeah. you know, you have, you have this uncomfortable history that's kind of just been lost to the, to the ages, but it's, it's an interesting thing because as soon as the history started to be unearthed, they immediately put it at the forefront yeah. and you never know with a company, did they do it because they felt it was the right thing to do or did they know about it before? And it just didn't fit the narrative. Right. You just, you just don't know. Right. you know right and so at jack daniels they have a whole wall now when we did our film there was even a segment in our film where they were like uncle nearest here's the wall of uncle nearest it's all the uncle nearest things it's like in jack daniels's office like right next to the safe that killed jack daniels and you've like you've you've got all this you know this uncle nearest stuff right here and they talk about how there's never you know uh, nearest was distilling whiskey. And then Jack came onto the call family farm. You know, he was an errand boy and then he was interested in distillation and nearest taught Jack how to distill. And then Jack brought nearest on. And then when they opened the distillery nearest retired and his, you know, his, his descendants took over and that, you know, they'll, they'll be the first to let you know, there's never been a year at Jack Daniels since it was started that there wasn't some, family relation however obscure to, to uncle nearest you know they're like we've always kept the near you know a, a nearest family member on property they've always been a part of the distillery and it you know the credit to them that they that as soon as they whether it was they felt like they were about to be called out or they they really uncovered the truth and it started being talked about and then they put it up at least they put it up we're seeing right. a lot of companies that are taking the the opposite approach where they're like, well, it's our company and our story. We'll do whatever we want. We're not going to call attention to it, but they've called themselves out, All right. um, which is, which is pretty cool. And then, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think it's good, you know, better late than never, yeah. but it's still unfortunate because this is just one instance. How many instances of this are still obscured into the pages of, of forgotten history? Like people don't realize Elijah Craig, you know, Elijah Craig is one of the, 
I promise I didn't set these up before. <laughs> I had no idea where we were going here. We started real <laughs> but, quick. So yeah, there's no way you could have pre staged these. <laughs> but uh, a lot, I just have a lot of whiskey. But Elijah Craig um, was one of the largest slave owners of his generation. He had a grist mill. He had, you know, he established one of the first fire stations. He, he had a huge whiskey company. I mean, he had a ton of companies, but they, they were all manned by, it was all run by slaves, you know? And nobody talks about it at all. They, they just hold Elijah Craig up as the, the holy entrepreneur that invented the barrel aged bourbon, even though that's like dubious at best. Right. Nobody really <laughs> knows where that came from. But, you know, it, you have all of these people that like they've cr- constructed this like early American white frontiersman history. And, you know, they, how much of, of that is the uncomfortable history that was swept under? How many of those frontiersmen were, were backed by, you know, slave labor or how many immigrants came in and actually created those recipes because they've right. been doing it right. across the pond. Right. And we don't know, but people like me are hoping to dig into the history and find out, you yeah. know, I'm writing a book right now called blood bourbon. And it's all about, um, we have no idea when it's coming out as soon as I'm able to finish it, but it's, uh, you know, it's all about the uncomfortable history that people don't want to talk about. You know, the, the rise of organized crime, how religion played into whiskey, you know, the, how the, fir- how the first time the federal militia was organized against the people was because we turned around and bit the hand that fed us. And all of those distillers that helped get us through the Civil War, they wanted to turn around and like tax insanely. And I'm talking about all these things that like are the darker side of history that people don't really want to discuss. But it's people, you know, people like me, people at like the Fraser History Museum who are constantly, you know, pouring into stuff. A lot of my fellow, you know, a lot of my fellow, uh, you know, whiskey influencers and historians and writers, we're all trying to dig down and, and, and kind of unearth what history that we can so that we can share it with people and share it with our following. Cause it's every time we find another nugget of information with the whiskey, you know, when it comes to whiskey history, that story just gets a little bit more complete, accurate, and truthful. And that's kind of what we're on, what we're looking for is the, the truth in the history of whiskey. Because if you look at whiskey at any point in human history, it reflects the values, the society, the culture that we were in at that time. Yeah. So the more that we uncover about whiskey, the more we uncover about ourselves, which is really cool. Dude, I think that's that's that that's whole statement. That that that's amazing. I think that embodies that this whole conversation. Um, appreciate you, man, for just like keeping it keeping it hundred, keeping it, keeping it very real with me, keeping it uh, very truthful. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate appreciate your authenticity um, and just coming on here and just showing what you know. Um, what else you guys got going on before we before we uh, get out of here? What uh, what do you got coming up next? Um, so we're we're doing a Florida season, which is funny because that's where I'm stationed out of. Um, okay. I started whiskey culture a little over five years ago, and I haven't done a, a Rick House season in Florida, which everybody's lambasted me about for years. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do that, um, but we're hitting a pretty good growth cycle. I mean. Um, it's cool for us where we've kind of evolved from just a blog into like a full on media outlet, a content production company, videography, um, that starts. branding, we're doing that all starts. kinds of stuff. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I mean, it's crazy because it started with me with a blog and then I hired one of my best friends uh, on as my production manager and camera guy. And then it was us traveling around. And now, uh, you know, then I hired another one of my friends I met in the whiskey community as my PR guy. And he's, he's the one that does all my event bookings and appearances and book signings and stuff like that and then you know now i just brought on another one of my best friends from high school as as my you know marketing and and or as my uh operations and sales manager to make sure everything goes the way it's supposed to so that i can keep focusing on what i love doing which is just spreading the gospel of whiskey and writing about it so it's it's cool it's been a wild ride it's scary um but very fun and very rewarding. I'm very passionate about this. And like, I told my wife, it kind of started as this like beautiful, I'm, I'm a total book nerd, love history, love culture. And uh, I told my wife, like, if I could just write for a living, I would be the happiest guy in the world. Mm. And I got super lucky because this ended up being the medium. Like I, I love the science and history of whiskey. I love the culture of it. 
Um, I love the people in the industry. I love how many multifacets there are because it really is. It's a bit art. It's a bit science. It's a bit business, you know, and, and I get to spend my time, you know, reading and researching and meeting great people and traveling around and making new friends. And I mean, I, I really couldn't ask for more in life than that. And, you know, my wife and my daughter get to come with me every now and again. We, we went in November they, they flew up to uh, Kentucky and we got to take them on private tours on, on all of the biggest distilleries in Kentucky. And they just walked us around so my wife and daughter could see what the hell I do. <laughs> right. so it's, oh, this is what you're out here doing. Cool. <laughs> Justifies it a little bit. It's like, oh, so you're not just out just, you know, partying, having fun all the time. You're actually doing some work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was kind of, that was kind of the thing because it's funny, you know, it's, it's easy to like go, and go to these distilleries and, and people, we hear it all the time. People are like, oh, you guys are the luckiest guys. Like, if I wish I could do what you do and like, that must be so fun. Like, do you actually, you know, is it actually work? And it's like, dude, I, I will hit the bed on these trips and just saw logs immediately. Like we, we work so hard, but yeah. we, we do have so much fun doing what we do. Yeah. So like, we look forward to that kind of stuff, but it's, it's one of those ones, man. We work hard and we play hard and it's all worth it. So that's about it. That's awesome. But, yeah. If people want to check us out, they can check us out on whiskeyculture.com and we're whiskey culture on every social media platform, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the whole nines. We have a private um, whiskey group on Facebook. That's pretty cool. You can join too. It's just literally whiskey enthusiasts. Okay. But we all just like share what we're drinking that night and chat and ask questions. It's pretty fun. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm looking forward to connect connecting with you, especially throughout the year, man. It's, I can feel like we could do some some solid work together. Absolutely, my friend. Yeah, yeah, it's been great being on on the podcast and meeting you and getting to share my passion with with you and your viewers. So I, I'd like to thank you too. And absolutely, I would more than love to do more stuff with you. Heck yeah! All right, man. Well, until next time, <laughs> I'll talk to you. Sounds good. All right. Have a good one. Yep. You too. <laughs> Thanks everybody for tuning in. This is uh, the night show. <laughs>